this smoke pouring from below the ground through the vent is the only indication that something isn't quite right at the Dotiki coal mine. Early this morning, the fire sparked from a malfunctioning machine. Since then, mine rescue teams have been fighting the blaze. On February 11th, 2004, uh, we was getting ready to have a district staff meeting at the district office. And I was notified by Alan Boswell, mine superintendent, that that had a mine fire, had a uh, Gitman on fire. At that time, I notified the district manager, Carl Boone, and we got everybody together and come to the mines. A guy come out of this the cutthroat, and uh, he was screaming and hollering. He was down on his all uh, force, and I couldn't understand what he was saying. And uh, uh, when I got him calmed down and got over to him, then I found out that he said he had a Gatman or Jeep on fire. I had mine rescue experience, so I put on my apparatus and everything, and I just couldn't believe when I got there the heat. This is my second fire, and, and you're nervous. You're really nervous. First thing, you don't want to get nobody hurt, and you want to get to the fire and try to get it out. But your main thing is don't get nobody hurt. The smoke was so thick that you couldn't see the hand in front of your face, and and you, it was hot, like and your eyes were burning. You just can't imagine the heat. I mean, and the way to deteriorate the roof. And, and we didn't make it very far because of the, the heat, the smoke was so hot that uh, it felt like your skin was burning. And uh, then it was really getting, getting hard to breathe. Uh, there was sudden stuff floating in the air. Finally, the, the heat got so hot that it melted the water line in, uh, in two. We actually fought the fire that day till we lost our water on that side. It, it, it melted our water line. They were fighting it from both sides. This is called the number six and three side. This is called the four and five side. So they had some people on both sides of the fire trying to get in to this vicinity here. And they could only get within two or three cross cuts on each, each side of it before it was at because of the smoke and the heat. We got a foam generator started and started foaming. And uh, we advanced up, I'm gonna say, 80 to 100 feet uh, and fought the fire from there for a pretty good while. Then they lost their water on the, on the west side and uh, we brought the other foam generator and knocked a hole in the bradish and put that foam generator right on the get. And uh, we foamed for two or three hours. Well, I understand that Mark Evans had opened the door to the air shaft, the return air shaft is directly in this direction. And you could stand where I'm standing and there was absolutely no smoke two foot out. It was like being in a barrel of a, a steam engine. It was just pure black smoke. To me, that was one of the, the major things that brought everybody out safe, was getting those doors open. The significance of him opening that door was it changed all this air that you see here was going straight to number four, number five units, and there were men on those units. Then when he opened these doors, it reversed all supply road air and all smoke, and everything was in a in a safe area. This fire occurred and uh, rapidly uh, got out of hand to where we couldn't uh, fight the fire and a determination was made later that day around 4.30 to, to seal the mine after we, all the firefighting efforts underground had uh, failed to extinguish the fire and the gas was rising at the fan. The gas readings at the, at the shaft were coming up and uh, it was determined at that time that we need to evacuate the mines uh, we felt like that probably three to six months, or maybe possibly a year, mines will be down. If you are fighting a fire, you do need some kind of plan to, to back up if that fire fighting plan doesn't work. Uh, we had some plans that we had worked on during the night. As I was driving up here, I talked to uh, Ted Norris, who's our general manager of technical services, and uh, we, we had hooked up, and he had hooked up with some people that had put in uh, the Halliburton or the remote seals. We had talked to people that had uh, worked with the jet engine from Australia. And all those people we called in contact were coming the next day. So we met with the jet engine people first. Pro is that you, you render the mine atmosphere inert very quickly, but there's a lot of destruction involved with the moisture that the jet engine puts into the air. So then we talked to the Halliburton people. At that point, that's when uh, Charlie said, well, this guy from MSHA, their expert came in. Let's go see what he has to say. The company elected that that was the method they were going to try. They thought that they could do it. They talked to the folks at Halliburton. Halliburton folks uh, thought they could do it. And, of course, we at MSHA uh, were hopeful that it would work also. 
uh, within less than 14 hours after the fire started, they'd already stood, started drilling holes into the fire area. Uh, within uh, 20 hours, they'd started putting inert gas into the fire area. We were monitoring the, the uh, CO and, uh, and the methane and oxygen there at the air shaft, you know, behind by the fan there every five minutes. Well, we, you know, we kept monitoring. We had uh, three, three holes that were drilled from outside and they kept monitoring. And basically when we first started out, we were monitoring them every 15 minutes and then we went to probably 30 minutes and then to an hour and then four hours. And then basically now what we're doing is we're making them, you know, ever, ever shift. Still, still kind of looking at some of the readings behind them. But you know, the Hilti seal is basically just a piece of curtain and we used the little Hilti guns and shot the little nails into the rib and sprayed foam around them just to kind of give us an airtight, you know, barrier from the far area. The holes drilled, cased, and well heads on them, and the, the nitrogen or CO2 delivered immediately began to, to pump that into the mine to try to inert the atmosphere in there. And we've got it down to where they would just be tenths of a percent of oxygen. The remote sealing operation is an operation where they actually drill holes into the mine, a series of boreholes, and they put in a, a concrete mixture to try and fill up the mine entry uh, and seal it off. Once they got those underground and got them pumped and uh, everything, then they felt good about the conditions underground to let us go back in and then build, you know, permanent seals. That's basically what you want to do is shut the oxygen off so the fire will hopefully smother itself out. 17 seals on the east side. We built eight seals on the north side and seven seals on the west side. The uh, control room really would be comprised of the senior officials from mine management. There'd be the senior officials from MSHA, uh, from the local district, and also the senior officials from the state of Kentucky. And they would work together. Uh, of course, the company would develop a plan in conjunction with the state and the federal. And when the plan was agreed upon, of course, the, every, all the participants would sign off on the plan and then go to work. And with each little obstacle that came up, the group was able to get together, resolve the problem, and move on to get it, to get it uh, done in such a quick fashion. Take advice. You know, that's what everybody did. Everybody sit down and took advice and listened. Uh, a lot of times that don't occur in a mine fire. Well, I think any time you have a, a situation like this, it's pretty dynamic. You have a lot of different people coming together. There's different levels of knowledge. Uh, sometimes the people who have to spend the monies are not really familiar with the process and they have to have a trust or dependency that the advice they're getting both internally and externally is credible. And I think that's what made this work. There was an immediate recognition of the knowledge that MSHA had and our willingness to work in a cooperative effort to resolve this, this issue, this problem and concern they had. And on the front end, we made the right decisions alone with the company and that cooperation uh, went right on through the whole process and they, from what I've seen so far they're very appreciative today and they have a different respect and understanding of this agency than they did probably two months ago. We had a few disagreements but they were professional disagreements. Uh, we did not have to go off into our corners if you will and and have our plan and MSHA have their plan and the state have their plan uh, everything was right on top of the table. Uh, everyone was focused on the same end in mind. I've been in this business since 1975, and I never thought, I never thought that, number one, that MSHA had this type of technical support of this caliber, and number two, that I would ever see us working that close in such cooperation uh, with Hampshire. I don't remember ever being in this kind of situation where everybody acted as professionally as this group did. The Mine Emergency Response Unit, which a big part of that was the gas lab that was set up right back here. Uh, the thing that, that I'm so proud of is we were learning and in the middle of the night on Saturday night, the staff back there, we would talk to them and they would talk to us about gases and they would talk to us about helping us watch the gases. I think tech support brings a level of knowledge that is international. 
I'm not so sure, I've been to a lot of different countries, that there's anybody anywhere that has the knowledge base and the energy. I mean, when tech support comes on property, there's an immediate uh, energy level that's, that's just sent out. People begin to feel that. Those things that MSHA wanted is what we wanted. And I think as we worked through the process and as we went through the next week, it became obvious that the decisions that we were making and the proposals that we were making, we were doing in a team effort, and that what we wanted was the same thing as what MSHA wanted and that was to do the safe thing, to do the right thing. In the last three years, I think, have really shown what can, what can be accomplished when we take the barriers down and we're willing to work across boundaries with each other to partner and to work toward a common good. Because, see, we all have the same goal. We all have the very same vision. We have the very same vision you have. We have the very same vision that your families have. We have the very same vision that this company has. And it's what I've been saying all along. It's going home to your families every day. Each and at the end of each and every shift in a healthy and safe condition. That's what this is all about. And for a company like, uh, like Alliance, it's about making safety a core value in their organization's business. And I think they've shown that they can do that. February 11th I had a mine fire. And we go in there and we do a lot of strenuous work on, from March the 3rd to March the 8th, building seals, carrying blocks, setting cribs, building, you know, putting timbers up. Uh, and getting the mine back to a production state and no one was injured. 